All right. I am here with Lauren Amon, the founder and head coach at Performance Reimagined. Uh, Lauren, welcome to the show. Thank you, Greg. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. We were talking uh, a little bit before we started hitting record. I'm, I'm excited to have this conversation with you. Uh, really find what you're doing interesting, plus also very relevant, uh, just because I'm, I'm the, the father of, uh, of two daughters who are both athletes. And I think a lot of the things that you touch upon in, in, in your practice and your business are, are, are relevant to, you know, my personal life, but I think it's going to be relevant to a lot of people's lives. So anybody who doesn't know, maybe you could just take a second and, and explain what performance reimagined is and, and, you know, how, how you started with this. Yeah. In the simplest form is to say that we work with elite student athletes to train their minds like they train their bodies. Uh, and this really actually came from a combination, actually really from my own experience, and then being hit in the head with a, a pretty poignant message by Michael Phelps during the 2020 Olympics. Uh, so I'll give a quick background. So I was an athlete myself. Uh, I started swimming when I was five years old, and I am a very rare breed, and then I did swimming my entire life. That's really all I did um, until I graduated from Eastern Michigan as team captain, high school state champion, top three finisher in the MAC, and by all by by any definition, a very successful athlete. Uh, but I also retired thinking and feeling I had so much more to give and there was a little bit of untapped potential that I didn't know how to find because I was always in my own head and, you know, I couldn't go back and redo my entire swimming career. So I just, you know, kind of went into the real quote unquote real world and tried to figure that out. Uh, turns out I didn't figure that out after 15 years, uh, him in human resources, um, I kind of got to the point of, I there's just something else I want to do. And I didn't want to repeat the leave potential on the table kind of thought that I had when I left swimming. Uh, so I ventured out on my own, got my professional coaching certification, uh, started in leadership development and career transition and career development. Cause that's what I knew as a professional, um, had some success, but again, still wasn't completely fulfilled. And, um, it was, during the 2020 Olympics. And it was the night that Simone Biles removed herself from competition. It was the same night that Katie Ledecky won gold in the 1500 meter freestyle, the first time that women ever got to swim it at the Olympics, but she didn't have the greatest swim. She was about 20 seconds off of her world record and pure speculation as a spectator. It was kind of like, you know, she may have felt a little bit disappointment in, the, in that respect mm -hmm. and just kind of watching her go through that emotional response. And then Michael Phillips came on that same night, uh, who's always been a big proponent of mental well-being among athletes, and said something that I had been thinking and feeling for, gosh, I think 30 some odd years at that point, but didn't know how to articulate. And it was competing at this level is really overwhelming. We just want someone to talk to. We just want someone who listens, who allows us to be vulnerable and doesn't want to fix us. And it was, it was this like, yeah moment of yeah that's exactly what it feels like this idea that in some way maybe you're a little bit broken but you're really not or you're the only one going through it and you don't know how to get through it and everyone just tells you put your head down get over it and get through it you'll be fine doesn't feel fine um and so that was the moment that I thought oh my gosh that is it to work with elite student athletes to train their minds like they train their bodies yeah there's so much to unpack there. Are so many <laughs> thoughts and ideas that are going through my head right now. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to think about the best way to, uh, you know, take this conversation forward because there's a lot of parts that you mentioned there that are, are, are really interesting to me. Um, you know, I, I think one, one just particular that comes to mind is, you know, I, I was an athlete myself, mm -hmm. uh, division one college, the whole, whole bit. And, you know, I, I think I'm a, a couple years older than you, but we, we sort of came up at a, around the same time. Right. Yeah. So, uh, I, I think one of the things that's really changed culturally, and I think for the positive and, uh, you know, the, the thing you mentioned with Simone Biles is, is, is a good example of this is the willingness for athletes to be more vulnerable in their mm -hmm. discussion around the mental side of it and the mental health aspect of it and, and, you know, how pressure, you know, can build up and, and, you know, how that can affect somebody uh, emotionally and, and all those different types of things. And I, you know, I grew up in a world, I was a football player of all things where it was like, mm -hmm. you just, those things you didn't talk about at all. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if you were, if you mentioned your emotion, you were soft, right. Like mm -hmm. you weren't even, you know, considered play. Um, what are your thoughts on that transition? When did that, 
transition start to happen where we we started to to be just more aware and and acknowledge the importance of the mental well-being side of it uh, for athletes? That's a really great question. And I don't know that I could pinpoint one specific example. Um, You know, being a swimmer, I obviously follow swimming and swimming comes up um, every four years, maybe a little bit more frequently after Michael Phelps kind of brought this sport um, to the forefront. Uh, I would say from a swimming standpoint, he kind of in a way led the way, right? You know, you saw he, he, he came onto the scene really like a prior to 2008, but it was 2008 where he was on the map and he was going after that gold medal count. Right. And then after that, he was really on the map and between 2008 and t- between 2012, you saw him get into some quote unquote trouble, right? He he yeah. had some breakdowns, you know, DUIs, drug use, whatever the case may be. But you also saw how he was kind of at the top of his game in 2008. Like 2008 was his pinnacle, right? And then 2012, he didn't necessarily have the greatest meet and you could kind of see that demeanor and that, um, um, I don't know, I, I was about to say like silver medal kind of um, persona, but I don't want to like label him in that respect. You just, he just wasn't in the same spot. And mm-hmm. I think it's been like that over the, since maybe, I guess that would be a decade, right? So that was like 2008 to 2012. I think it's really been in the last decade, right? I mean, you've seen him come to t- come talk about this. You've seen Kevin Love come talk about this um, and, and a number of different others. And unfortunately we've seen some pretty drastic things happen at the college scene when, when athletes have chosen to, uh, take some pretty drastic measures because of the pressures and not being able to handle it. Um, and then I think the pandemic really just like, boom, put this on the map because it was this time where our, everybody didn't, didn't matter what level you were on, particularly our Olympians, we're literally relegated, we'll use swimming, for example, to backyard pools and yeah. to lakes. And everyone, it, it, like everyone went through the pandemic and we all felt the psychological burden, heaviness that that created. And I think it was kind of the, unfortunately, the pandemic that really kind of brought this to fruition. If you're looking at it, the gymnastics side, right, unfortunately, that big terrible controversy with with the trainers and the doctors you know bringing that to fruition and you know looking at it from um Simone Biles herself like talking about that the pandemic hitting and then having get to the Olympics right it all just culminated in this like quote-unquote perfect storm for it to really just come rushing to the forefront and say yeah this is now the opportunity to really stop start to talk about this because we see how much performance can be affected when mm-hmm. athletes minds aren't completely taken care of. Right, and, it, and there's two sides to this, right? I mean, there's performance, like your ability to go out there and compete and play yeah. and play at your peak performance, but there's also, I, I, I guess, happiness in life, yeah. right? I mean, because some of the issues are are, are not necessarily performance-based, it's it's what happens off the court or off the field mm-hmm. or out of the pool, right? It's, it's people's, uh, ability to sort of deal with life and you know I, I know some of the stories you talked about in the college ranks and you know unfortunately you know people who who've taken their own lives right mm-hmm. and, you know for for mental health issues um you know when you when you think about what you're doing and the conversations you're having and your philosophy and your approach um do you look at it as as trying to address both aspects of it or or, or you know primarily when people come to you is it more performance-based no, it, it really is looking at both sides of the equation. And that's my whole approach is like looking at the entire athlete, knowing that the two things are not mutually exclusive, you know, their athletic life and their, the other parts of their lives. Um, and I was very, very intentional about that to, to make the connection that yes, through the lens of, of most athletes is how do I become better? But actually in our practice, it's like, how do I, how do I look at myself differently to enhance my performance versus how do I just get faster, better, stronger, fitter, whatever Mm -hmm. the case may be. It's like, how do I become a more effective version of me so that I can influence my performance in a completely different way and see results maybe I wasn't necessarily thinking of simply quote unquote, simply, (laughs) because I'm focusing on my whole humanity versus just the performance aspect of my humanity. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I, so I'm, I'm good friends with uh, uh, former PGA tour player. His name's John Mallinger. He played, you know, 10 years on the PGA tour and, it, you know, had a lot of success. And we've, we've talked a lot about the performance side of, of his, you know, sporting career. And, you know, one of the things he had mentioned to me at one point was there's a lot more golfers that are, are much more talented than him. But when he's staring down a, you know, a five foot, bender on Sunday to, to win a tournament, he's going to make that putt. And, and a lot of golfers will crack under that pressure. It's just that mental anxiety. Mm -hmm. And, and as a recreational golfer, I've, I felt that before, right? It's, it's like that the more time you think about something, it's just so easy to get tightened up and you start mm -hmm. to get this, you know, what if I miss and you're not thinking about the right things. Luckily I played a sport I said it before football where it's like you walk up to the line the play starts and like, you don't have time to think, right. It's just like sort of chaos and training. So I never had to worry too much about the mental side. So I guess my question is, you know, you think of something like swimming, right. It's like the, 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 the gun goes off, you're in the pool, you're swimming. How, how does mental performance impact you in the moment versus a sport like, you know, you know, maybe it's a basketball and you're standing at the free throw line and, or you're a kicker in a football game, or, you know, you're a gymnast and you have like sort of, you know, your vault and it's, it's like your moment and you have that time. You got to sit there and think about it. And it's like, you can kind of quote unquote choke. Can you choke in swimming? Oh, for sure. It's kind of that same thing. So if for anybody who's watched the Olympics, right, you see, uh, swimmers, you know, kind of in the waiting room, you know, there's every, when it gets to the Olympics, there's certainly not as many heats as we call them in swimming as there is in a more, you know, age group type, uh, swimming. And so there could be like, you know, 15 heats of 200 yard freestyle. And you're just like sitting there like, here we go. How, how long is this going to take? And it is that time to like sit and like, you're watching all of these swimmers ahead of you. And, as a swimmer, you kind of know, you, you have a great idea of like how fast quote unquote people are supposed to swim in their heat because it's all based on time, right? And so like the slower you are, the earlier your heat is, the faster you are, the later your heat is. And so you're watching. And then when you start to see like people have great swims ahead of you, you can start to think, oh, oh dear. Especially if you're, if you go to finals and you, and you want to swim again and it's for an award, you're kind of thinking, oh, oh, well, she swam really fast. Oh, oh, well, you know, she dropped like 10 seconds. Oh, okay. Well, um, what does that mean for me? Right. And then, and it, you just start spinning and spiraling and, you know, at the Olympics, while they just certainly don't have that many heats, they have that waiting room where you're coming out before you swim and you're, you're, you're in there surrounded by the seven other girls or guys that you're swimming against. You, you, you know who they are, particularly at the Olympics, right. You know how, how they swim or what, what they're capable of. And you can just start to overthink and overanalyze well what if this happens what if this doesn't happen or what if what if I didn't train as much as they did or what if you know whatever the case may be it all becomes the what ifs what if what if what if and that's often right as humans and particularly as athletes it's like what if something doesn't happen versus the oh well what if this does happen right what if I swim way faster than I ever anticipated right you know we automatically go to that negative side of the equation versus Hey, I just trained my ass off. Like, I, I'm feeling pretty good right now. This is an opportunity for me to really shine. Right. And so, yes, you can choke in swimming because just like any other sport, you're starting to overthink because you're looking at everything around you and thinking, uh Oh, what if I don't. You, you, this sounds very personal. You mentioned <laughs> earlier uh, that, you know, you had a lot of reflections on your own swimming career and mm -hmm. it sounds like you could have a lot of what you do, you could have used, or it's like you're filling a gap or something that you wish you had had in your, your own life. Can you talk a little bit about that? A hundred percent. I was the biggest perfectionist. Yeah. Um, no matter what time of year it was, if, if it was the time of the year, I wasn't quote unquote, su supposed to swim my fastest in my mind, it was I'm working really hard. Like, what does it all matter if I don't swim really fast right now? Or what, it, what is, what are mom and dad going to think if I don't swim really well? And let me, let me be perfectly clear. My parents never pressured me to do anything. They were, they were mm -hmm. the very laid back parents who were like, we just absolutely love being here and watching you. But the way that I put pressure on myself was, Hey, they invested a lot in me. I want to, I want to show them that the investment they're making is paying off, right? That's how it translated in my mind. 
Um, and it was biggest perfectionist paired with the biggest overachiever of like my worth and my value is predicated on how I perform, what I do, how I show up. And because those things were so intricately related to me and my identity was so wrapped up in swimming, it was kind of like, well, if I don't swim well, who am I as a person? Yeah. So let me ask you a question. Where, where, do you have brothers, sisters, older brothers? I have two sisters? older sisters. Yeah. Okay. So you're the youngest. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. That was also part of the equation, right? Gotta beat sisters. Gotta be better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, with my kid, I was talking about this uh, before we got on. Yeah. You know, I have two daughters, a, a 12 year old and a 10 year old and my 12 year old's um, really talented athlete, but without a doubt suffers from major fear of failure. And there's mm-hmm. just, you could just see it and she, she wears it and she, you know, I think it limits her because at times she's so afraid to fear to, to fail that she won't take on challenges for mm-hmm. that. Where her younger sister is like fearless, strangely. And, and I, I think with them, their dynamic might be a little bit different. Her sister's always been younger. Her sister, is like used to messing up, right? Her sister's used to not being as good. So I think that like failure to her is like, yeah, this is no new, this isn't new to me. I, I'm always the younger sister and I'm always behind my older sister where my the older sister has kind of been, you know, set up as this, you know, she's the first born, she's the oldest in our family, the oldest grandkid, all those types of things. So mm-hmm. I, I was just curious if that played out with you, but, but I think, you know, what you mentioned is also true too, where it's like, if you have that innate competitiveness that's inside of you and you're always trying to like live up to something now, you know, now that, that failure kind of weighs on you. Yeah. And I, that was all self-induced though. Like my parents were never like that. My sisters weren't yeah. even like that. Right. I was just the youngest. So I was the third to do everything. Like nothing I ever did was like new, right. It was, it was never yeah. novel. I was, they've already seen it twice. Um, and so in my mind, I think I created the story of, Ooh, well, this is a way for me to stand out. This is a way for me to do something first that maybe my sisters didn't do. Um, and what's more is, you know, both of my sisters were stroke swimmers. So my oldest sister swam breaststroke and my middle sister swam butterfly, but we all swam distance freestyle, but I really specialized in distance freestyle. Um, and so it was kind of like my way of like, Ooh, can I be the fastest here? Can I try to like, quote yeah. unquote, make a name for myself in the family? Um, again, my family is like not, we're, they're super supportive, but it was just my innate competitive nature of like, how do I stand out and how do I show my worth through swimming in a way? Yeah. So you get down swimming and, you know, you, you, as you said, you go into sort of a traditional career path, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you spent, you know, the better part of how, you know, a number of years, as you said, in HR, like working for, for companies. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that I, truly respect and uh you know it's a big part of the show and and it's one of the reasons why i like to interview you know entrepreneurs in general is the risk aspect of starting your own business and Mm -hmm. that risk is significantly higher the older you get the farther along in your career you know things that you're leaving behind uh you know it's one thing for a 22 year old kid that quite honestly doesn't have anything that's got three roommates and no family, no responsibilities to kind of like put it all on the line to start a new company. It's something very different for somebody mid career that's had a successful career to say, no, I'm leaving the steady paycheck and the benefits and all these different types of things. And I'm going to go out on my own. Um, Sounds like this was a true calling for you, a true passion. Uh, Talk to me a little bit about that transition and that decision. And I, and I, and I know, you know, you, you didn't go directly into performance uh, reimagined, but like just even moving into executive coaching in the first place, I'd love to hear that thought process. Yeah, it was, it was a journey to, that started the minute that I got into corporate America. I just didn't know it. Right. I always say I never felt at home in corporate America and 95% of that was me. Um, because of the environment that I like part of my conditioning of where I came from, right? I came from a very supportive very competitive, but very supportive team. And it was just, I I felt so at home. And I think when I got to corporate America, I was fully expecting to like go back into that environment. Like I, I didn't know that there was no other environment out there. And when I couldn't quite find that environment in corporate America, it was like, when I was 
before I kind of did all my self-discovery, I was like, it's all them. Like, really, it was all me. But um, I discovered that later. But for me, it was more of like, I just didn't feel feel fulfilled. And, and knowing what that feels like, having been an athlete, I just wasn't willing to just keep going because it's what I quote unquote should have done. I, I truly wanted to feel that sense of fulfillment again. And the only way that I could see that at the time was to take the risk to see if I could create it myself. Could I find that fulfillment and create the atmosphere I came from that I love so much on my own in a different way? That was my transition. It was like, I was more afraid of not seeing what I could build than I was afraid of staying where I was. Did I say that? Yeah. I think I did. You did, you did. <laughs> So how did you how did you ease that transition? How were you able to manage it? Was it like a like a cold turkey? Like um you know I'm I'm going to you know leaving this thing to go do this thing, or was it one of those things where you were able to start kind of reeducating yourself, preparing, kind of putting things together while you you know were still sort of gainfully employed, and then you know at a, at a time you were able to make that transition and jump. Yeah, I'm a risk taker and a jumper. So for me, it was kind of cold turkey. Um, it was one of those moments where um, I, I really do take a lot from my swimming career, right? So as a swimmer, you know, you have a choice at practice. You either dive in and get your butt kicked on this really tough set, or you walk out of the practice and have coach be mad at you. So I'm conditioned to just dive right in, see what happens and, you know, come out the other side, whichever way that happens. Uh, and that's kind of the route I took. I tend to be a very um, gut instinct kind of person. And I knew it was the time. And I, was, I knew that if I didn't do it now, I may never do it. Or I would resent myself for doing it. So I literally went cold turkey um, and had just gotten to a point where I was ready to walk away and see what happens versus being a little bit more planful than others. I love it. Well, let's dive into the... Uh... The, the business let's start, yeah. dive into your coaching practice so you're you're working with elite student athletes so do you have a like age, age range that you specialize in yeah ideal uh is really kind of that 15 to college so 22 um i have some clients that are even younger who are more on the junior high age uh and all of that really kind of depends on the athlete because um you know some of my younger clients are some of my I would, I didn't expect to have that young of clients, but they are amazing clients. Uh, but that's kind of my ideal age range. Yeah. And all sports, men, women, oh, does, it, yeah. does it matter? All sports, guys, girls, um, everything. I, what I've come to find is that, you know, obviously there's a huge difference between swimming, swimming and football, right? Two wildly different sports. Um, but if we sat down and really dug into our stories, we would have experienced a lot of the same things, yeah. just, you know, one's in a pool and one's on a field with a, uh, 10 other guys. Um, and so what I've come to find that there's a huge relation between sport based on the experience, not how, what, what the actual sport is. Mm -hmm. So what are, what are some of the strategies? Like when you're, when you're, you know, start working with somebody and you start to think about things like mental toughness and resiliency, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what are, what are the strategies or, or some examples of strategies that you try to help, um, young student, um, athletes cope with or deal with? Yeah. I mean, it, it all kind of boils down to the same thing. So what I really do is I spend, uh, I don't know, two, three, maybe four sessions, really just getting to know the athlete. Cause it's really important for our practice to really understand each athlete at the individual level. Now, mm -hmm. while they're all going through different things, they all kind of come out to be the same thing, whether it's they're dealing with what we call their inner opponent, right? That voice inside their head that is saying they can't, they shouldn't, right? You know, you, you talk about your older daughter, like, oh God, what's gonna yeah. happen if I don't do well, right? It, that, that fear of failure or that fear, fear of success. There's a very fine line between the two things. Um, at the end of the day, that's ultimately what we're getting to is what is going on inside of them that's keeping them from performing at their highest level. It could be the inner opponent, most often than not it's the inner opponent. Um, sometimes yeah. it can be inner relations between their teammates. Um, and their coach, right? Depending on the sport. Um, and really it's all about understanding what is causing them the most stress 
And from there, how do we unravel that for them? And what I always tell them is this isn't something that's easy to measure, right? That you, you can't go in and say like, oh, you're better today, you know, those kinds of things. And, you know, we really create the relationship that we are here to support you. But as an athlete, there is the expectation that you're doing the work, right? That you've got to put your head down and really understand and, and be willing and be vulnerable and open up in terms of what really is uh, at the heart of what's going on for you. And then we individualize it per athlete. And we're also very upfront that it's an experimentation that, you know, we'll, we're going to try something if that doesn't work. All right, great. We tried it. We'll put that down on our sheet and say, that was a red. Nope. Red. We're not going to try that one again. Um, but that's what we do work with them is like, well, red, yellow, green things of it's red. No, 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 I didn't like that. Doesn't work. Uh, yellow. Hey, going a little bit more time and experiment with this or green. Yep. That absolutely worked for me. So let's keep doing that. Um, and then we kind of build their routine, if you will. Um, and we really encourage them to do those things daily, just like they do in their physical training, because come game time or meet time or race time or match time, um, those things will become innate and they're just become habits versus trying to do these in the moment when things are on the line and it becomes hard to focus. What are like some examples of um, tactics that you're teaching? Is it like self-affirmation or, I mean, like help me understand like what, what an athlete would be doing. Yeah. Yeah. So we do self-affirmation. Some really like that. Some are very diligent about creating them and then I'm um, repeating them. Another one that has worked really well with a few of our clients is the three to one ratio. So um, oftentimes we talk about, we talked before that oftentimes our brains will automatically go to the negative, right? of the, oh my gosh, this isn't going to work out or, oh my gosh, this is, um, you know, this is going to be terrible. So what we really work on with them is the three to one ratio. So for every one negative thought you have, think of three positive thoughts to help get your brain back to neutral. And mm -hmm. we start with, okay, what is your first negative thought of, oh my God, there's absolutely no way I can do this. Okay. What is the exact opposite thought? I worked my butt off and there's absolutely no way I can't do this, right? And we tend to do it in a little bit more positive language. Um, but what we get them in the habit of is the minute that you think that negative thought, what is the exact opposite thought? And what we also tell them is that it, it's, it's not a flip of the switch. This takes some time and some effort and some energy to get into the habit. So if someone is used to constant negative self-talk, that flip of the switch of positive self-talk isn't just going to be overnight, right? And we encourage them, you don't have to fully believe it right now. You don't try on the thought and just repeat that thought to yourself. If you can't think of three, we also say, just repeat that thought to yourself three times. Repeat that positive thought to yourself three times, just to get them in the habit of breaking that pattern of automatic negativity. Yeah. I mean, this, this sounds like something that, that goes well beyond just athletics, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that this is, that this is stuff anybody can really take within them their day-to-day -day lives. hundred yeah. percent. You know, and we also, what we all work on too is, you know, we set goals and oftentimes the way we set goals is a little different. I mean, not, but we just put a little bit of a different spin on it. So another thing is, you know, it's, one of the biggest challenges that we face as humans is that we're, we're very outcome focused, right? It's like what I achieve is who I am. And that's where my worth comes from. And it's understandable that 99.99% of athletes believe those kinds of things, right? So we look at goals a little differently, set your, what we call outcome goals. Like I, I want to be state champ this year, or I want to swim a certain time, or I want to start a certain number of games, whatever the case may be. Um, but rather than that rather than back that up with physical skills you may want or need in order to attain that, what are some of the mental or emotional skills mm -hmm. in order to help you achieve that? Um, and then we, what we also say to them is that, you know, hey, just because you're using this for football, for swimming, doesn't mean you can't use it for school. You can't use it for relationships with mom and dad. You can't use it for relationships with coach. But we get them in the habit of identifying like short mini action, small mini actions they can do every single day versus these like big behemoth, like completely change who you are as a person. It's just, it's predicated on the 1% better every day through consistency. What, how how self-aware are our kids nowadays? I mean, I it's hard to remember what I was like at that age, but I, I probably didn't have enough life experiences to know that my inner voice was holding me back or even really be able to like, you know, yeah. 
Right. And you're absolutely on point, but they can pinpoint that inner voice. Yeah. Like even, even, even the, the sixth grader I work with, she can very much pinpoint the voice in her head and what it tells her and how it, how she feels, right? We had to bring that to, to the forefront for her, but she can very easily articulate what it says to her and how she feels when she hears it. Yeah. I, no, I, I don't doubt that at all. And, and, you know, I've had those conversations with my own kids and, and my, my daughter in particular, the one that I've talked about, and she's, she's made comments where it's clear that she has that inner voice. And, you know, that's where my, my uh, fear, fear of, fear of success, fear of failure thing comes from. Uh, when you, when you're, you know, out there and you're, you're bringing on new clients, I'm assuming though, it's, it's mostly parents that are coming mm -hmm. to you and saying, Hey, I recognize this in my child, mm -hmm. you know, can you come talk to them? Um, when you have that first conversation in, in, in many cases, do, do, do the kids automatically get it or does it take some time for them to understand what you're trying to help them accomplish? Every single one that we've worked with has gotten it. Yeah. Right. They may not necessarily have um, complete awareness of everything we go through, but they get there's just something. They may not necessarily see like how they're affecting their own performance. Right. That's part of the, the awareness that we go through. But they they know something is, quote unquote, off um, that they seek support. And, and oftentimes Greg, oftentimes it's really just someone to listen who isn't mom, dad, coach, or someone who's completely and dialed in and tied to their outcome. Often, like yeah. when I get testimonials from the clients, it's, this was just such a great place to come and talk to somebody who I knew wasn't trying to judge me or had no, no subjective agenda. Yeah. Isn't that, isn't that just the truth with anything? I mean, sometimes it just, just yeah. listen. I just need somebody to talk, to talk to <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and, and we're very open to say, Hey, you know, we're here to challenge you in a very supportive and compassionate way that we're, we're holding up that mirror to you. You know, like when you, when you talk to us, we're holding up that mirror and saying, okay, totally understand. You're absolutely valid. And it makes total sense. You are where you are. How might you be contributing to what you're experiencing right now? And oftentimes it's just that question. And they're like, oh, mm. Well, no one's ever yeah. said that to me, it, but in a compassionate way versus get your head out of your ass and move on. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, one thing that's of interest and I, I talk about it with my own peer group um, is, you know, we sports has just changed in so many ways from, mm -hmm. from when I was a kid, right? Like I played all sports seasonal, you, you show up, you play your sports season ends, you put your, you know, your bat and your ball and your glove in a closet and you don't pick it up for another four months, five months, six months, whatever it is until, until the next, you know, and then you go to basketball. And now it's like highly specialized, right? And travel and year round. And, you know, it, it's a lot of pressure because if you want to have a kid that's competitive, you feel like you have to continue to to have them play with their peer groups, which involves sort of year round sports. But then if you're now playing two sports, you get into the situation where it's like year round, two sports, constant. I mean, my daughter's got that, you know, practice till 9 30, 10 o'clock at night. I mean, she's 12 years old, sixth grade, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's just the way it is. I have a lot of friends who are a little bit ahead of me who had, you know, quote unquote, elite level tracking kids who then just got to an age and were like, I'm out, I'm done, mm -hmm. I'm burnt out. So I, I think burnout's real. And mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on burnout and how to avoid burnout. And what's what's the healthiest way as parents to kind of help manage and, and, and coach their kids so that yes, they follow their passion and you know they, they compete and they get all the benefits of athletics and sports. And I do a podcast about the benefits of athletics and how it's carried through in my professional career. I'm a huge believer in athletics and it's not about becoming a pro. It's just about all the things that come with it. Um, so I don't want my kids to burn out, uh, but I, I have to kind of manage that balance. I'm curious your thoughts. Yeah. This is always a, a tricky question for me because I was a one sport athlete. Yeah. You know, I, I, I didn't dabble in other ones. Um, I wasn't pressured dabble in other ones. Uh, I think my mom and dad knew I loved it so much. They, they didn't want to, um, have me feel as if I had to do something else just because they wanted me to do it. Um, but they also didn't pressure me to stay. That was, 
that was me. Um, so to answer the question of, you know, how to really prevent burnout uh, for parents is listen to your child, right? Yeah. You know, you're right. It, it is so competitive and, and, you know, the NIL, I don't know that that helped any, um, yeah. you know, because you, parents, coaches, athletes themselves may start to see dollar signs much earlier than they would have before. Right. Um, but that's the one thing I love about that commercial from the NCAA is what, like 99.9% of the college athletes go pro in something other than sport or whatever the statistic is, right. right. Yeah. Very small percentage. Um, in, in, in parents, it's, it's almost tempering your own expectations. Right. And as a former athlete, that, that was one of the hardest lessons for me as a parent of young athletes. As I, I look at my son's my older son, who's also a sixth grader, he is the like, you know, go from football to basketball to, to, to baseball to swimming. Like he is constantly in something different. Mm -hmm. If I were to say to him, pick one now, he'd be like, Oh no, absolutely not. Right. I love my little rotation and what I get to do. And I had to realize my children were not the athlete I was. They're, they're, they're not going to choose a sport at five years old and fall in love with it and never want to do anything else. Right. And then my, my younger son, he's not always into sports. Again, that was a hard lesson for me too. Of like, how do I have a son? And my husband and I are like sports fanatics all across the board. He did, he's like, eh, I don't really care. Yeah, it's fine. I'm like, <laughs> oh, you know, and, and that was a hard, that was a hard pill for me to swallow as well. But I listened to him and that was the greatest lesson that I learned as a parent and a former athlete is one shut my mouth, right? That that's, it's not my life while I have a say in how their life goes, they ultimately have to give me the sign yes or no, whether they want to do something or not. Um, we do have a, a rule in our house though. You start a season, you finish the season. Um, even if you never want to play it again, you start it, you That's finish terrible. it. Um, but I, I would say the, 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 the burnout question is hard. How do you prevent it? You, you kind of let, yeah, you can. Yeah. I mean, you gotta let the child be able to express what they're feeling. And if that, if that is, I want to quit at the end of the season and you and your mind are like, Oh, but you're so talented. You could go so far. If you just kept going, maybe the break is exactly what they need for a hot second. Maybe, maybe it is a season that they just want to sit out and see what they're capable of or, or see if they want to do something different. So I guess at the end of the day, the advice of a parent is, or, or, or the message to a parent is they're your children, not you. Uh, so it's an opportunity to see life a little bit through their eyes, a mix of between your eyes and their eyes, because you still are the parent, uh, but listen to them and see what they want. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's, that's good advice. Uh, and, and spoken from someone who's, who's in the trenches on their own with their own children. So you, you, you know, you have a unique perspective, not just as, uh, as the coach side of it, but as, from the parent side. Um, you strike me as someone who might be kind of competitive. Am, am I, am I reading that right about you? hundred <laughs> percent. Where, where, what is it? What are the, uh, the family monopoly tape, uh, games like at, uh, at the household? Oh, they're, uh, they're intense because my older son too is super, he like is maybe more competitive than I am. Like he cheats. I'm like, no, 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 no. We don't <laughs> cheat. If you're going to win. You're going to win on merit. Um, but yes, they are very fun and we are a very competitive crew. Um, I've learned to temper my competitiveness, uh, as I've gotten older, except of course, when I just want to turn it on and I just want to go full on. Right. Yeah. Um, but with my kids, I try to go back and forth. Although I was the parent when they were younger, never to just let them win. No, no, no. They had to earn it. Yeah. Better. I love it. You still, uh, do you still swim or do you still do any type of uh, competition yourself? I do not swim. Um, swimming can be very boring when you're just doing it by yourself. Right. I, I, I love when just literally showing up to practice and someone having written it for me, all I had to do was show up and do it. Uh, now as an adult, if I had to create my own practice, no, I don't want to do it. Um, I, I did take up marathons and half marathons, um, yeah. for almost a decade. Um, but then when I had kids, it was, and they got into their own sports, it was really hard to say, oh yeah, I'm going to go out for a three hour run and, you know, kind of fit that into the schedule. Um, but now I, I do Peloton in my basement and what's great is there's that little leaderboard on the, um, Peloton. So mm -hmm. I get to compete in that respect. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I, uh, I'm, we're all, we're an all in Peloton house. So mm -hmm. tre tre treadmill and bike, me and my oh. wife both, we, uh, 
mm-hmm. we got we we got we went all in uh, when COVID started. We were oh for sure. We were, yeah, we were doing yeah. Uh, cross. We were we were doing CrossFit, and we mm-hmm. did it forever and ever and ever. And it's like such a community, and you become friends with all the people that you do it with. And you show up, and you have somebody that like first kind of tells you what to do, which is mm-hmm. nice. You don't have to think about it. It's like I yeah. show up, and I know an hour later I'm going to get a great workout, and then. Uh, the community aspect of it. And I, I, I feel like we found that with Peloton. So yeah, how to make it, exactly. Yeah. So we have the bike. Uh, it's on my list to get the tread. I'll never get that rower. No, 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 no way. I will yeah, never do a row. <laughs> I can't do like a half an hour row <laughs> workout. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so, you know, when, when you think about what you're doing, how, how can coaches play into this? Right. Mm. Um, like, you know, like I, you know, I'm, I coach my, my daughter's, you know, softball team right now. And uh, I've been coaching for the last couple of years. I coached my older daughter uh, before she moved on to travel ball. And I, I personally love working with the girls and building a relationship and helping develop them. And, you know, I, I was talking about this the other day, like so much of, I think my job as a coach is beyond the fundamentals of the sport and how to play the game and manage the game. It, it is the mental aspect of being an athlete. Um, what advice do you have for, for coaches out there or maybe just parents that are coaching their kids on helping them kind of deal with this, this the psychological aspect of, of athletics? Yeah, I mean, that is one of the big things because I hear from a lot of coaches of like, I, I, I wasn't trained in this stuff. I don't, I don't know how to do it. And when you don't know how to do something, you know how important it is. It can be intimidating, right? So as a coach, it's understandable that you're kind of like, I don't know what to do in this respect. First and foremost, it's it's really about meeting each athlete where they are as a human, right? You know, there was a study, um, oh gosh, I had a, a George Washington, I'll have, to, I'll have to look that up, but there was a study done among eight to 18 year old student athletes. And it was like, what are they looking for most in their coach? And there was five things and hopefully I can remember what they were. It was being a good listener, uh, being a good communicator, leading by example. Um, gosh, I'm gonna forget the fifth one. The fourth one actually on the list of five was your technical skill as a coach, right? Mm So when I think back of, and the other one was another, the the fifth one was a soft skill and I can't remember what it was, but it's it's to show you that 80% of what athletes are looking for is to be connected with as a human versus what you know about how to coach the sport, right? When Mm -hmm. I think back to my coaches, I never once thought about, oh gosh, I hope he can teach me how to swim. It was almost like an assumption that you are my coach. You know, the fundamentals, that's not necessarily what I'm looking for. But again, if I, I think I was kind of aware of of this when I was 12, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old, I was like, understand me as a human, like know what you need to do to get the most out of me. And sometimes that was you know, getting me a little angry, getting me a little competitive to like get the juices flowing and get going. It was never, to, you know, no, no athlete wants to be dismissed and, you know, overlooked, even in those moments where, you know, again, speaking as an athlete, when I tell you to, you know, use some choice words as an athlete and tell you to get out of my face, I still wanted your attention. I still wanted you to really understand that, like, theoretically hold me, hold me close, keep me, keep me, um, protected. Just help me understand that what I'm, I'm going to be okay when I come out, you know, I'm, I'm going to be okay on the other end, even if it doesn't go my way. Um, so as a coach, it's really all about understanding the human in front of you. And one of the questions that I, I think could be really effective for coaches is what is the one thing you want me to know to help me coach you more effectively? Mm. And, and, you know, your athletes may come up with a technical skill, but as a coach, dig beyond that. Like, okay, well, technical skill aside, what is it you want me to know about you as a human in order to coach you more effectively? And I, it's all about asking questions and just being really, really curious, even though that takes a little bit more time, performance actually will increase. Yeah. Regardless yeah, of teaching them a new skill or hone a new skill. Yeah, I think that's a, that's, that, that's a great way to, to start building that relationship between the, the, the player and the coach. So where, where, do, where do you go with your practice, right? I mean, you, you, you started this, you kind of mentioned, uh, you know, the, the, the catalyst point and, and, you know, why you're doing what you're doing. You're working with a lot of 
uh, elite athletes. It's an interesting role because I could talk to you in 10 years and then you're going to have, you may have like a long list of like professional athletes and like household names of people who have kind of come up through your, your, your program. Um, you know, how do you see this, this, this growing? Where do you, where do you want to go with it? Do you, do you see yourself continuing to work with these athletes as they make their transition into the professional career? I just, what's your outlook? That's a great question. So the whole the whole premise was started on you know working with elite athletes and developing athletes because they're at the most um, accelerated mental stage of their life, right? Your 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 brain like your brain made all these connections when you're an infant, and it makes the sec it makes more if not close to the same amount of connections when you're in that kind of that adolescent age. So it's kind of like how do we support young developing athletes on these skills that will not only support them on the field. Uh, during this developmental time, but as they continue to grow. So yes, I would love to see this kind of, you know, work through the transition of, you know, going from high school into college. That's part of the um, vision is that, you know, more and more colleges are starting to understand and put uh, resources behind this kind of athlete development role of looking well beyond just, you um, the, the actual performance side of things. Not every school is getting there, but the idea that, it, you know, if we work with them in high school, you know, we can support them in college if they don't necessarily have the resources or they just want to continue with us. Um, you know, we're also looking to, how do we make this a little bit more accessible and in bite-sized pieces, right? So knowing that we're working with very busy athletes who are going to school, doing their sport and multiple sports, potentially trying to have a social life in that respect. Um, you know, how do we get them bite-sized pieces that they can, um, obtain and use and, and coach and teach on their own time. So, so being able to provide them with a little more sound bites versus just one-on-one -on -one or, or working, you know, closely with us. So we're looking at how do, how do we expand in that respect, not only to get a little bit more, but do it a, a little bit more on their time, on their schedule and what fits for them. Um, but yeah, it, it really is all about like staying with the athlete as they grow and mature and see what happens to know that they always have support whenever they join the performance reimagined team, no matter where they go. I love that. You know, we, we talked about this earlier. I, I started this podcast, you know, really out of uh, an appreciation for entrepreneurs, but also mm -hmm. because of the importance athletics and sports played in my own life and, mm -hmm. and how many of the lessons of athletics I've, I've taken with me and I think have, you know, helped me, you know, be successful in, in, in different parts of my my own life. And I, I, I think as I, as I, I listen to this, and one of the reasons why this is so much interest to me is it's, it's it's obviously clear the mental side and the importance of uh, sort of getting that inner voice in your head aligned the right way and saying the right things to you. And, and you hear about everybody from like LeBron James to whoever that have, you know, mental performance coaches. And, you know, this mm -hmm. isn't anything new, but I think what's what's really important about this is, you know, as you said, 99% of, of student athletes are going to make their career in something outside of their sports. And I think that that's really true. And even those that go on and do professional or play, you know, at the highest level, whatever it is, it, it, they're going to be done when they're, you know, pretty young in their lives. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you, people's careers end in their twenties, early thirties, you know, and they're going to spend the rest of their life figuring out what to do. The mental coaching that you're doing now and getting people, um, comfortable with understanding how to contain that inner voice i think it's something that goes well beyond just just the athletics and the sports and the short-term aspect and it really is something that they'll take with them for the rest of their lives yeah i mean it's something that pops up every day as an entrepreneur like there's so many parallels between you know being an athlete and, and being a business owner or even being a leader inside of a business you know that inner voice creeps up whenever we go to do something big that's outside the norm of what we normally do or we're trying to try something new that inner voice pops up no matter where you are when there's fear and uncertainty on the other side right or more more uncertainty on the other side that's where the fear settles in is so we don't know what's going to happen um but yeah it is uh, that inner opponent you know the moment that i kind of like stumbled upon that and kind of you know incorporated that in as, as, as a, from the branding standpoint, right, the inner opponent, but, you know, from a competitive uh, point of view, it really does speak to a lot of people. Um, and even as, as adults, and my husband and I talk about all the time too, of like, oh, there's our inner opponent in shining through like, on our children, yeah. right? Um, but it is something that once you become a little bit more aware of it and really start working at it, it is something that you can conquer and um, manage no matter yeah. what situation you're in. 
And with the, uh, you know, I think COVID kind of, one of the positives came out of COVID is this medium right here has just become mm -hmm. better and, mm -hmm. and more accepted. And I mean, we have conversations like this and it, it it's not that much different than being in a room together. So your, your coaching is not all just localized to people who live in the same city as you, right? You, you, you do a lot of your coaching in, in remote environments, very similar to how we're talking now. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and it's, I, I have such an appreciation. Well, first and foremost, the United States from an athletic standpoint is just one of the, you know, we have such, we have so many resources and, you know, for better, or for worse sometimes, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, an opportunity of so many great athletes across the United States. And yes, that that's what I love about this. It affords the opportunity to be national and to, to have a reach well beyond Cincinnati, Ohio, which is where I'm located. Uh, but also to be very lucky that in Southwest Ohio, we have a phenomenal athletic footprint. So anybody out there that's listening that wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to get? Yeah, so we can go to performancereimagined.com, which is the website, and then follow us on Instagram at performance underscore reimagined underscore. Okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll include all those links in the show notes. So anybody that's, awesome. uh, that's interested, uh, listen, I find this really fascinating. I, I, I definitely want to continue to understand this. Um, so yeah, maybe in touch with the offline and, and 100%. Talk, have you talked to my daughters, but, uh, it was, it was great to speak with you. I really, um, admire what you're doing, admire you, uh, following your passion, um, leaving the comforts of sort of the, uh, the corporate, you know, job and, and, uh, starting your own company. And, 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 you know, I, I think it's absolutely so needed, um, you know, what you're doing as a company. Well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the opportunity to have conversations like this, uh, just to showcase and have a great connection with people like you and, and, you know, allowing others to put ourselves out there. Fantastic. Thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks, Greg.